One, two, three, four, let's go. It's hardly. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. I heard be Alaska. It's hardly. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Bear Oak. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining me. On today's program, we travel to Tanana, Alaska for a dog mushing symposium. We meet with over a dozen mushers as they share the history and some treasures of knowledge and wisdom. It's a great show. I'll be back with dog mushing from Tanana right after this. Heartbeat Alaska would like to thank the following sponsors for making our show possible. Browns Electric. Thank you, Browns Electric, for your generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska would like to thank Cognac Incorporated. Without their support, this show would not be possible. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Comtech Business Systems Incorporated and by the Maniluk Association, providing health and social services to residents of Northwest Alaska for over 30 years. Welcome back. Over the years, dog mushing has changed from a necessity to a sport. We've gone from the trap line to the starting line. Join me now as we travel to Tanana, Alaska and learn about this timeless tradition. Footprints in the snow tell the story of a people who have walked this land for centuries. A people who earned their way, hunting and gathering on foot. But as we follow these footprints through time, they suddenly end and a new print begins. Man's Best Friend. It's a title that our four-legged friends have earned over the years. It's hard to imagine how dogs have changed our lives so drastically, but the truth is they have. Over the years, dogs have taught us about loyalty, commitment, working together, and have made life easier for thousands of people across Alaska. Oh my God. Oh my God. Their strength and endurance have helped Alaska Natives not only provide for their families, but has allowed us to travel great distances in less time. In 1925, dogs would leave their paw prints in the pages of history forever as Norwegian musher Leonard Seppala and his dog team began the trek from Ninana to Nome with the life-saving diphtheria serum. Today, however, dog teams are no longer used for hauling wood, gathering, or hunting. The snow machine has replaced dog teams for traveling purposes, and dogs have taken on a new role. Sprint and distance racing have become the specialties of today's dogs. The dogs are bred for speed and endurance. Alaskan Huskies have been crossbred with European dogs, and today's Eurohounds have become the dog of choice. <laughs> Raising dogs and running teams is no easy task. It's a lifelong commitment that requires dedication and long hours. Every day, mushers must feed the dogs, run the dogs, and train the teams to work together. It takes years of experience to raise and run dogs, experience for which there is no substitute. We've always been a real, um, really into dog mushing here in Tanana, and, and it's really uh, important for us to keep this tradition alive here. 
And that's why the community of Tanana recently held their first dog mushes symposium as a way to learn about the art of raising and running dogs from some of the world's top professionals. Some of these veterans have been driving dog teams long before dog mushing was a sport. For several of these mushers, driving dogs was a way of life. A lot of people try to go out and live subsistence by, you know, having, having a generator and having this and, or, you know, all this new stuff. And to me, what the way to do it is get to the basic, the core, what's worked for the people here for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And the, the fish, the dogs, and that, you know, what we call the old time stuff, that stuff is, has such a firm foundation that it'll work. It worked then, it'll work now. But you gotta give up all the, <laughs> you gotta give up all the other stuff. But that, that's pretty much where the dogs came in with me. They feel that, um, anyway, it wasn't a gap, it was what, I just had to have the dogs to make everything work. I used to haul all my firewood with dogs. I did my trapping with dogs. I even, I even drug the, dog, the logs up to build my home with dogs. So the dogs were, were a, uh, a integral part of my whole lifestyle. We utilized the dogs year round. The summertime, we have them pull a rowboat on the beach like my dad and I. He didn't have uh, money to buy an outboard motor, so he had to utilize the dogs to pull 10 bales of fish at a time from 10 miles below Kayakuk, and it takes about four hours. The dogs are hooked up on the harness, and the uh, rope is tied in the middle of the boat, and the, my dad would just steer the boat. And when they get up to the cotton caving area, the dogs would go in the water, and he would just say, ha, gee, and they would swim around the snakes. I trapped with dogs. I, I didn't just get into racing. I trapped with dogs quite a few years before I ever before I ever raced. My my first my reason for having dogs wasn't for racing. I thought I thought racers were uh, were uh, sort of nuts. I uh, I'd I'd uh, heard about George Atlund and I uh, read his story and I knew he was nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't want nothing to do with that racing part. <laughs> I hope, hope George heard that. The thing that was going through in my uh, mind when I ran the Iditarod was, I must be crazy, you know. And I really didn't, uh, after it was over, I thought, it wasn't that bad, you know. So I tried it again, and that's when I really found out I was crazy then. Crazy or not, these mushers have been raising and running dogs for a large part of their lives, and there's one thing that holds true for all of them. They love it. If you uh, raise some dogs and raise some pups and uh, one of them becomes a leader and uh, start is obedient and uh, start uh, doing what you want it to do, man, it grabs a hold of you, you know. The dog mushing grabs a hold of you and you, you get ca caught into it. And 40 years down the road, you're still playing around with the son of a guns, you know. And uh, that, that's what happened to me. 40 years later, I'm still, still behind those dogs. From this table came a wealth of knowledge that's not available anywhere else. These dog mushers share trade secrets on breeding dogs, how to care for dogs, the different styles of harnesses used throughout the years, to the types of sleds used over the decades. European mushers started coming to Alaska and running in our races and they started beating us by minutes and minutes and seconds. And they're using these all newfangled sleds made out of fiberglass and they look like real cross-country skis on the bottoms of them and they're brightly colored and they're light. And these new sleds were beating us seven seconds a mile that they were gaining time with our traditional wood, wood sleds. And in uh, some corners they might cut off 20 seconds 
And we're thinking, seven seconds a mile, and they're only beating us by 20 or 25 seconds overall in a race? Now these new sleds, they're, because of the flexibility that's wanted in the sled, we, uh, we done away with all of that. And the sleds I'm building now are completely built out of uh, just using bolts and plastic and uh, some snow machine parts in there. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just the design we gotta come up with if we wanna be competitive, you know, in the market, uh, in the world market on dog sleds. Years ago, all the dog sleds and stuff uh, was all, especially native made uh, sleds were made with that babish. What you do is you put it in water and you soak it and when it gets uh, real limber, then you put it on your sled, and, and as it dries, it tightens up. It, it goes back to like it is there right now. Usually what we used to do, I, I, I've done some with a friend of mine named Jake Butler. We used to start in the center of a moose hide and work your way out uh, by cutting it with, like, with a pocket knife, and, and you cut it, and then you stretch it like a clothesline. You put it in between trees and uh, stretch it out. I think that... Uh Feeding dogs red meat is um, is one of the things that has changed a lot on on the Yukon itself. Anyway, being able to feed red meat instead of just fish all the time. The first time I saw meat, I was probably about 10, 11 years old. I remember George Atla came to town here to race the our Yukon River Championship race, and I went down there and he was getting ready to feed dogs, and I saw him opening up all these Alpo cans, and to me, that was technology. It was starting, and we went home there, and we I fed dogs with my dad, and we gave them half a dry fish, and I think we they each got a cup of commercial with a little water, and they were ready to go. And I remember that really stuck in my mind there, as I can remember back now, as how much it's progressed in feeding. An old timer was telling me that. Uh when people start having an uh, interest in racing dogs, uh, when Leonard Chappella came up to uh, from Nome, and uh, one way or the other, New Lado or someplace got breed from uh, Leonard Chappella, and that's where the blue-eyed dogs came from. I think uh, Lake George S. Malka had a bunch, and Sanders Cleaver, that's where his dogs came from, that line of Chappella's breed, uh, blue-eyed dogs, you know. I've always had to drive dogs to really find out what's the good ones but it seemed like some people had a little bit more of a sense looking at dogs than I did anyway I said Lester which ones are going to be the good ones and I had a little idea about some that were doing a little better than others but um, and he says well he looks at them and he says well that's your good one right there and then he said, and those two other ones, they're pretty good. They're, they're going to be OK there. So you better just get rid of the other three. So I kept the dogs. I didn't listen to them. I mean, I listened to them, but it wasn't like I went and got rid of those three dogs. They just kept driving them. And uh, sure enough, in the end, when it was all said and done, months later, I got rid of those three dogs. And I kept those two OK dogs, because they were pretty good. And that other one was probably the, one of the two or three best dogs I've ever had. And so I'd just like to ask Lester right now, partially because I'd like to kind of hear him talk about it, and partially because I'd like to hear him get up here and say something. <laughs> I'd like to know what he sees when he's looking at these darn dogs. Well, I can see it. <laughs> I can see a lot of things that people can't, you know. And like George, George always does, he used to do that to me too, you know. But to look at the dogs, you know, I always look at their elbows right here. And if their elbows is about two, two inches, their chest, you know, their chest below their chest, and their back legs has got a nice curve to it, and it throws the motion like this, you know. And that's all you have to look for. If they don't got a good curved back leg and they're not, they ain't gonna run that good, you know. <laughs>
It's that simple, huh? That simple. Well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> Besides all of the secrets of the trade and the tidbits of priceless information shared at this symposium, there were also the stories from a day gone by and the memories that go with each. Back in uh, 1947, <coughs> I shot a moose in the camp in November, and uh, it was a cow moose and had a little uh, bull that was probably about a year and a half old with it, and the bull kept notching my back because I tried to butch the moose. I got it, and I went back home. I thought I'd get my mother to try to keep that bull moose away from me while I butch it up. And just then, uh, Morris Damoski and uh, Vincent Yaska came down on a pair of skates. I told them, oh boy, you're gonna gonna help me to keep that moose away while I butch it. And Vincent said, you got a rope? I said, I didn't take nothing, and I gave him brand new half-inch rope that we were going to use for tow line for the dogs that winter. So I gave him the rope, and we got up to the moose, and Vincent made a loop. I said, where are you going to be? I'm going to be a cowboy. He said, I said, what? He said, we're going to tie up that moose. We're going to come back in uh, Thanksgiving, and we're going to have moose dinner. He said, like a darn fool, we chased it between the two trees. He tried roping it. The first show, he missed a moose that came, landed on the nose. But the second time he, we threw it another between the not, another three, he got it around the neck and behind the horn. And the moose eventually got straight up like that and took off galloping like a horse. And Vincent hollering back to the end of the rope, him and Morris, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, <laughs> and the Vincent is a little man. The snow was only about four inches deep. I saw his footprints after about every 10 feet. <laughs> he was just flying with that moose. Flying in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. On your next visit to Anchorage, be sure to stay at the Creekwood Inn and RV Park. Now under new management, the Creekwood Inn offers 26 newly renovated rooms and a cabin that sleeps six. If you're in town for an event, the Creekwood Inn is the nearest hotel to the Sullivan Arena. The Creekwood Inn also has 68 RV spaces available year-round and offers winter RV storage with water, electric, sewer, and cable. The Creekwood Inn and RV Park is a proud sponsor of the Iditarod Fur Rendezvous and the Alaska Fighting Championships. So the next time you're in Anchorage, visit us at the Creekwood Inn and RV Park. Your Alaska State Troopers remind you that if you're transporting alcohol by common carrier into an area that restricts the sale of alcohol, you must clearly label the package with the words alcoholic beverages and attach an itemized list. Failure to do so is called bootlegging and it's against the law. Anyone with information on bootlegging is asked to call the Alaska State Troopers. Rewards of up to $600 are paid for successful tips. Let's all work together to stop bootlegging in Alaska. Six months ago, Claire made a promise to her family and to herself. The promise was she'd quit smoking by the time her next birthday came around. And already she's feeling better. She has more stamina, more energy, and her lungs are stronger than ever before. It's tax season, and living in rural Alaska means that it could take weeks, even months, to get your tax returns in the mail. It's always two weeks, sometimes six to eight weeks, if I remember correct. Let Liberty Tax take away the worry and the wait. Simply pick up the phone and call toll-free 1-866-563-2700. 
You can file your taxes electronically from the comfort of your home. You can usually have your check on at Gold Street the very next day. I go through John Hostetter. I trust him. I think I've got more on my returns with him than I would by myself. Liberty Tax guarantees the largest refunds at a smaller price and can often put money in your pocket the very same day. Quick and easy for me. So don't wait around for your tax returns in the mail. Give Liberty Tax a call. Liberty Tax, specializing in rural Alaska. Fast, friendly, trustworthy. That's how I feel with them. John's good people. In the 1890s, pioneers carved a railway through the rugged mountains between Skagway and the Klondike. More than a century later, the White Pass and Yukon route still makes this legendary run. Along the way, life has gotten better for folks working on the railroad, thanks in part to Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska, a health plan that's offered smart choices and quality coverage to the people of Alaska since before it was a state. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. The relationship between man and dog has been one of respect. They have managed to coexist forever by taking care of each other. Dogs have played an integral role in the history of Alaska Native people, a thread that is weaved through the centuries. But more than that, they have helped us to provide for our families and communities. They're our protectors, our overseers, and have helped us to stay in good physical condition. We were dependent on them and as well as they were dependent on us. I remember coming down from, uh, uh, coming down as a kid from Crosshag, we were traveling and all of a sudden, our lead dog just took us way around. And a grandpa said, what's going on with that dog? And grandma said in our native tongue, it must, oh, there must be a water hole there. And uh, that dog sensed that there was running water, there was a big water hole underneath the snow, and just took that, that lead dog, just took the team right around it. You know, nobody's gonna get on that treadmill or go to that gym every day or do whatever, do a 500 setups or whatever it is you wanna do. To, uh, it all sounds good, but nobody does it. But when you got the dogs, you have to do it, you know. It ain't like, it don't take much discipline, you know. You gotta run them, and so you gotta be out there doing it. And it's a motivation to keep you really active. I'm uh, 71 years old now, and I keep dogs for other reasons. I think probably some of the same reasons that the rest of the guests here keep dogs for, you know. It's a lifestyle, and uh, Really, it's good for your health because they're, you know, you have to work on them all the time. And uh, a lot of times, the old lady might be mad at you and tell you to get out of the house, and you walk into your dog yard, and the dogs will all be wagging their tails and hollering, wow, where's the champ, you know? So. You know, for all those different reasons we keep dogs, you know, they make you feel good. And, uh, yeah, and I believe, you know, anyone that starts out in dogs, you have to feel good with what they're doing because you get it back in return. And far as the health thing, if you want to lose weight and get in shape, <laughs> chase. Chase dog, chase dogs around in about four foot of snow, breaking trail for uh, 12, 16 hours, and uh, you forget about your weight problems and all that other stuff. Other topics included the future of dog mushing in Alaska, and different ways to incorporate dog mushing into the world of tourism. You got to teach these kids how to care for uh, care for their dogs. You know, there's. Uh, you know, got to feed them every day, to water them first thing in the morning, and then before you run them, 
but also too is we try to teach them everything we possibly can out on the trail and uh, what they need and what they need to do and all all them kind of things and it's uh it's a lot of fun i have a lot of fun out there teaching them and uh, we have a lot of fun watching them drive dogs it's it's a great thrill and i'd like to see more people I know it's hard when you're training dog teams and stuff to volunteer your time, but it, it's really rewarding to see some of them kids when they get it and start doing uh, some things. Uh, it's really amazing. When we help out a lot with the kids' races in Fairbanks, and I see all these new mushers trying to come, and they're a kid that are like a lot of you kids sitting in here. They're 10, 12 years old, and they want to drive dogs. And they go to the dog pound, and they find one dog, or they go to somebody and get one dog picked up, and they come to the race. And they have an old wooden broken down sled somebody gave them. They have a really ratty tow line, but they're trying. And then they have to have one parent at least to take them to that dog race. So it's a family event. And everybody at that race is trying to help them and give them little tips of the trade that that's okay if you have a bad sled. That's okay if you have bad lines, you know, just work with your dogs and enjoy yourself. I think tourism and dog mushing Especially guys with big names. You guys, you guys got got a name. Your name is famous. Your name is worth something. You've got an advantage over, over even guys like me that that I actually, I, I have a name too. But it ain't in dog mushing. It's in talking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> big opportunity there, and I wouldn't pass it up. I wouldn't pass it up because tourism is increasing in Alaska because it's a safe place and it's ex ex exotic, and it's just like a foreign country, even to the people living in the States. What the future of dog mushing holds, nobody knows for sure. Some say that dog racing is fading away, while others are just beginning their journey. Oh, Regardless, there's a passion for the sport of dog racing, and a love for the timeless tradition of running dogs. Thank you everyone for joining me for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Information. This time of year, dog mushing is happening all around the state of Alaska. These guys are so tough and so ready to share their information. This is a great show. I hope you tune in. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless every single one of you, and we'll see you again next week.